Hi, I'm Jimmy Koo, Senior Legal Editor for Bloomberg BNA. Privacy and security related issues have recently dominated the headlines, bringing terms like data breaches, encryption, and cybersecurity to the forefront of public discourse. In 2015, high profile breaches at Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield, the Office of Personal Management, Ashley Madison, and other companies show that cyber criminals do not discriminate among companies or industries. Although it is difficult to precisely gauge the cost of these data breaches, they have significantly affected consumers and businesses alike. A recent study found that a data breach cost a company an average of $3.8 million, and that the cost for each compromised record is about $154. Cyber criminals come armed with an arsenal of sophisticated malware. Companies, more than ever, need to be prepared to respond to cybersecurity threats. Bloomberg BNA recently asked Symantec Corporation Vice President Sherry McGuire about what can be done to combat cybercrime. So cybercrime is no different than regular crime that we see around the world and have seen for centuries. So it's important to recognize that we can't stamp out all cybercrime, just like we can't stamp out all typical crime against persons or, or, um, or uh, property. However, there are two primary points about fighting cybercrime that I'd like to make. The first is around protection, and the second is about deterrence. So on protection, there are things that individuals and organizations can do on a, on a basic level to protect themselves. Just like you lock your door when you leave your house in the morning, it's important that you treat your data and your devices the same way, and you use the same kinds of security principles that you use when you're protecting your person or your properties. The second is on deterrence. Around the world today, we have a broad difference in laws and regulations. Many countries don't have robust cybersecurity laws in place or cybercrime laws in place. And in fact, even here in the United States, our existing laws for cybercrime are very much outdated and need to be modernized. So having comprehensive cybercrime laws to act as a deterrent, having uh, well-trained and educated uh, law enforcement, prosecutors, and judges uh, to go after the bad guys if they are identified and apprehended are, is another important aspect to this. And then the last piece is really about having the global coordination around cybercrime through organizations such as Interpol, Europol, et cetera, so that when these kinds of criminal activities are happening, that the ability to coordinate cross-border because cybercrime typically happens across borders, which makes it that much more difficult to identify and apprehend the criminals. So having this coordinated approach of both individual and organizational protection, as well as strong deterrence measures, are some ways that we can fight cybercrime. As the saying goes, however, prevention is key. Instead of addressing cybersecurity threats after being attacked, individuals and organizations can take certain basic steps to improve their digital hygiene and eliminate threat vectors. So in a study that was released uh, last year by the Online Trust Alliance, they found that about 90% of the uh, attacks that occur could be prevented by using basic cyber hygiene practices. These include um, modern security software suites, updating and patching your, your operating systems on a regular basis, using data loss prevention technology, using encryption technology, both for data at rest and data in transit, as well as multi-factor authentication, not using just a simple password. So those are five basic cyber hygiene practices that we recommend that individuals as well as organizations implement. And that'll help eliminate a lot of the attacks and threat vectors that are out there today. The recent standoff between the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Apple over the access to a terrorist iPhone hurled encryption to the forefront of the debate over balancing privacy and security. Many observers criticized the court order forcing Apple to assist the FBI as a major threat to protection of privacy. Meanwhile, others expressed frustration over Apple's refusal to cooperate. However, according to University of California Berkeley Center for Law and Technology Executive Director James Dempsey, Rather than a privacy versus security debate, it's more of a security versus security debate. Well, a little while ago, the, the director of the NSA, talking about cybersecurity, uh, said that encryption is foundational, and it really is. Um, this is not, in my view, so much 
a privacy versus security debate, although some people frame it that way. It's really a security versus security debate. That is two sort of uh, visions of security. On the one hand, strong, widely deployed, default encryption. And the other, widely deployed encryption, but with a government access option. And I think, um, to my mind, the technologists and um, companies have the better argument when they say building in those government backdoors or those government access points, whether you call them backdoors or not, building in that government access basically means you're creating a vulnerability. And given what we already know about the insecurity of our networks, the insecurity of our data, the incredibly high level and sophistication of the threats, widely deployed, ubiquitous, strong, unbreakable encryption has to be part of, of the answer to how we can secure this data that's so vital to our economy and our personal lives and the operations of our government. Really, the, the, the privacy protection model that we've had now for many years is based on notice and consent. This notion that you can be told what data is being collected and you click I accept in some knowing and meaningful way. And with the Internet of Things, with basically everything collecting data and always on and collecting data in very minute and granular ways, the notice and consent model really doesn't work anymore because data collection is inherent in the operation of multiple devices that we encounter and use in our daily lives. So we have to move beyond this traditional notice and consent model to a much more robust understanding of privacy that talks about uh, collection limits, use limits, uh, individual access and control over data in ways that up until now we have just not had. In February, President Obama proposed a $19 billion cybersecurity national action plan to boost the nation's digital defenses. As a part of the action plan, President Obama established the Commission on Enhancing National Cybersecurity to bolster partnership between the public and the private sectors in the development and use of cybersecurity technologies, policies, and best practices. According to industry experts, enhanced cooperation and information sharing between companies, as well as between companies and the government, are crucial in developing a solution to today's cybersecurity challenges. So addressing the cybersecurity threat and cybercrime today is really important to have public-private partnerships. Um, Symantec has a number of these partnerships around the world with both law enforcement as well as uh, with government certs. Um, we believe it's important that we share the kinds of threat information that we have uh, to, to help deter and go after cyber criminals. So for example, we have a partnership with Europol, the European Cyber Crime Center. Um, we also work with the FBI and other law enforcement agencies to, to uh, bring down, for example, a number of the international uh, botnets, the big botnets that we've seen out there over the last few years, and we have a number of really successful takedown cases. These kinds of activities are, are critically important to providing deterrence uh, of cyber criminals as well as securing systems and raising the level of awareness. So our view is it's really a shared responsibility between industry, government, and citizens to address the cybersecurity threats and the problem that we face today. And without that, we won't be able to continue making the progress. So public-private partnerships, shared responsibility, those are key components that we, we view as important to addressing the cybersecurity issue in the future. One thing we're focused on here at um, University of California, Berkeley, and through my project, uh, the Center on Law and Technology, we're um, looking at this question of cybersecurity information sharing. Last year, Congress passed new legislation removing some of the legal barriers to the sharing of cyber threat indicators and other indicators of compromise, both sharing between companies and between companies and the government. That's clearly not 
the silver bullet to the cybersecurity problem, but it is part of the solution to the cybersecurity challenge. And we're working now on a project to give some definition to that question of, okay, now you can share more information. What information really should be shared? What's most useful? In what context? For what kinds of actors? With the minimum impact on privacy? And so we're conducting a year-long set of um, interviews and surveys and um, efforts to, to, to give some definition to what is cybersecurity information sharing? What will work? What will be effective? Bloomberg DNA offers subscribers a deeper, fuller understanding of complex privacy and data security issues and provides insightful, real-world guidance from top practitioners and thought leaders. For more information, visit bna.com. Thank you for watching. For Bloomberg BNA, I'm Jimmy Koo.